Uh, Charlotte Perkins Gilman's The Yellow Wallpaper is probably, probably my favorite short story. Um, and I say that uh, for a number of reasons. And just as was the case with A Rose for Emily, I would strongly encourage you to read it um, before you watch the video. Because this is not the kind of story you want to have ruined. Uh, for yourself before you have a chance to experience it for yourself and chances are you will have experienced very few things like this before it has a lot to do with the the narrator the nature of the narrator and the nature of what's being described in this story okay so as we jump into the yellow wallpaper let's just make some basic technical um, observations that will help us as we proceed through the text so uh, I'm on page 151 here, all right, and if we just start from the beginning, uh, it is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself, okay, myself, first person narrator, secure ancestral halls for the summer. So, we have a first person narrator. Um, as we get into it, it's pretty clear pretty quickly. This isn't somebody that we would expect to have a you know, a magical level of observation. They're probably not omniscient. Um, do they have limited omniscience? That's that's really not evident in the first passage. But what quickly becomes uh, perhaps more and more obvious to us is that there's something about this narrator that's slightly off kilter. Okay, so as, as we go down, we might not notice it quite instantaneously but one of the things we might notice you know a colonial mansion a, a hereditary estate I would say a haunted house and reach the height of romantic felicity but that would be asking too much of fate okay I'm having a hard time following her uh, what is she what is she trying to say still I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it the house that she's in else why should it be let so cheaply and why have stood so long unattended? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that. Okay, so we have all of these questions coming up. You know, where is she? Uh, that might be an important thing to determine as she seems to be saying that there's something about the house that makes it sound like a haunted house. Her husband, John, laughs at her observations. Okay, maybe or that may or may not be so suspicious, but why would then you say that one expects that? And as we go on, and even without reading the story, although hopefully we have read the story, you know, let's just do something physically looking at the, the simple layout of the story. So if you look at page 151, don't even worry about reading it. Just look at how the lines are laid out. And let's flash back to, oh, let's just go back to the beginning of our anthology. Let's go to Uncle Ben's uh, Choice on page 3. And if you just, you know, skip from page three to page five, you have all these kind of nice, it's a first person narrator, right? These nice kind of thick paragraphs, lots of description, uh, lots of detail in each of them, these focused observations. Look at page six. Look at how long that second paragraph is in page six or the first full paragraph. And then let's go back to the yellow wallpaper. And if you just flip, from page to page, one of the things you notice is that all of the paragraphs are either exceedingly short or the story is simply told in a series of lines. Let's go to page 158. Go to page 158. You had a little section break. Um, look at how the narrator is trying to communicate with you. I don't know why I should write this. I don't want to. I don't feel able. Now, all of these things have been kind of broken up, right? So every line is like its own beat. There's this message, and then you go into something new, and then you go into something new. What would it be like to talk to somebody like that? What would it be like to have a conversation with somebody who couldn't sustain the thought for more than a sentence or two? It would probably be kind of challenging. You might think, boy, this person sounds kind of scattered. Uh, this person's having a hard time focusing. And, and indeed, you know, that's one of the great characteristics of this voice in this story is that we have this individual who is trying to relate something very important to us, but who speaks in this very kind of sporadic, almost distracted way throughout the story. And the question is why? Why is she talking like this? What, why is that so important? 
So if we look for the moments where she gets a little more descriptive, um, one of the things that we see is that she's more descriptive when she's talking about the wallpaper. <laughs> so if we go to page 153, um, we look a couple paragraphs down. She's describing the room that she's in. Um, and let's just sit tight with this room for a second because there are some questions that we might ask. Uh, so this is where she's being kept. Okay, this is the nursery. Uh, it is a big airy room. The whole floor nearly with windows that look all ways and air and sunshine galore. It was nursery first and then playroom and gymnasium. I should judge for the windows are barred for little children and there are rings and things on the walls. Okay, um, let's think about a few things here. Well, let's go to the next paragraph first. The paint and paper look as if a boys' school had used it. It is stripped off the paper in great patches all around the head of my bed, about as far as I can reach. Okay, and in a great place on the other side of the room, low down. I never saw worse paper in my life. One of those sprawling, flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin. Okay, let's think about a couple of things. She's in this giant house in a warm climate. Would you put the nursery on the top floor? Uh, if you if you had to leave children uh, someplace, um, and uh, would you put them on the top floor so that every time you had to go take care of the kids or that someone had to go take care of the kids, they'd have to walk all the way up to the attic? Also, have you ever been in, a, in, the, in the attic or the top floor of a large house, particularly one that doesn't have air conditioning? it's going to be unbearably warm up there, right? Particularly if there's windows and sunshine galore. And then we understand that the windows are barred. Now she says it's to keep the children safe, who used to be there apparently, but then why are there these kind of rings on the walls or things that we might associate with, you know, chains? And as we get through the story, we might have more and more reason to believe that that's maybe not, maybe it's not a nursery that she's in. So as we go through the story, one of the things that we get some sense of is that something has happened to our narrator. And I won't say exactly what in the video so that you can, you can enjoy that for yourself. But something has happened and she's in a space and she's trying to talk to you about something that's very, very significant to her, right? Which is the yellow wallpaper and the woman that seems to live behind the wallpaper that's continually creeping around. In fact, one of my... One of my all-time favorite descriptions um, is the moment when she's looking out the different windows on the different sides of the lawn, and she looks from one, and she sees the woman creeping, and then she looks to another, and the same woman is creeping over there. It's such an unnerving moment, right? It's really, really scary, uh, because clearly something is happening that doesn't seem to make any physical sense, but makes sense to her. Okay, so let's go back to our fundamental technical terms. We're thinking about uh, narrators. We're thinking about what kind of narrator this is, and we have a choice to make, I think, in terms of our narrator of the yellow wallpaper, and that is, is she reliable or not? Is she telling us things in a way that are accurate and true to her situation? Because if that's the case, then this is a really amazing story. Or is she speaking to us in a way that we need to recognize as being inaccurate, as being flawed, as being limited for one particular reason or another. Most people are going to pick option two, although option one is very disturbing and pretty upsetting. And just to show you how upsetting, let's go to the very end. It's, there's a lot of pages in the story, but because of the way it's written, it's not actually all that long. Um, I love this section. 166, this is a little more than halfway down the page. And this is she's at the kind of peak of her situation. Why there's John at the door. It is no use, young man. You can't open it. So she's talking to her husband in what sounds like a voice that is not her own. How he does call and pound. Now he's crying to Jeannie for an axe. It would be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John, dear, said I in the gentlest voice, which is even extra creepy, the key is down by the front steps under a plantain leaf, which is one of the reasons that we know this is a warm climate, because there are plantains, okay. Um, then sil that silenced him for a few moments. Then he said, very quietly indeed, open the door, my darling. 
I can, I said. The key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again, several times, very gently and slowly. That's really creepy. I mean, think about what it would be like to hear that phrase repeated that way in that tone frequently kind of whispered through a door. Like that's, that's very eerie. And then I said it again several times. Um, and said it so often that he had to go and see. And he got in, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What is the matter, he cried. For God's sake, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same. But I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane. And I've pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. Now, why should that man have fainted? But he did. And right across my path as well. This is the kicker. So that I had to creep over him every time. Okay, so when we get to the end of the story, um, you know, it, it it's pretty safe to say she's nuts. Uh, but 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 maybe she is also the spirit of the woman who has escaped from the wallpaper uh, and is now in, in inhabiting uh, our narrator. I think there's certainly a couple ways to take this story, um, and they're both equally fascinating. But one of the really neat things about this story, well, there's a bunch of neat things about this story, but one of the things I like about the story is that it's a story that kind of teaches us how to read it as we go along, which is a great thing that short stories can do, and that Gilman's is, is just a master of. So as we read this story, we get introduced to this character, and at first, we kind of buy into the things that she says, although slowly we start to think, okay, this person is struggling with reality. This person's having a difficult time distinguishing between fantasy and reality, and I'm seeing evidence of that in the things that she says. So I'm, I'm paying really close attention to her. I'm listening to her in ways that I might simply not. I'm listening to her with a level of seriousness that I might not give to any old average conversation or any old average narrator because... I'm not necessarily worried that everybody I talk to is having some kind of complete breakdown, right? Um, and so as I listen to her, I become very attentive to the words. I become very attentive to the phrases because one of the things I recognize is that it's in those words or phrases that she may reveal what's going on, what's happened. And I think there's multiple ways to interpret this. You know, one of the things that Gilman is very intentionally doing in this story is she's trying to comment on how it was that a number of women, particularly kind of middle class women, as our narrator appears to be in the late upper middle class women in the late 19th century, were treated uh, for psychological issues that emerged after childbirth. So what we would today call something like postpartum depression, right? Or really any number of issues uh, that may or may not relate to uh, childbirth, simple depression as we would understand it today, as well as no, a range of other mental disorders, and I won't get into describing all of them here. Uh, so please don't be offended if I don't say one that's you know most important to you. But it's sim simply it was that people were removed from society, placed in uh, locked rooms. Um, uh, Mary Todd Lincoln, for example, President Lincoln's wife, very famously. Uh, spent a lot of time in the basement, uh, locked up. Um, so th these ideas that you would take, it was usually women. And it was called, generally speaking, the rest cure, okay? The notorious rest cure, which essentially said that if there was something at issue with somebody, that the best medical treatment was to essentially isolate them. Horrifying implications, long, very tragic social history, which is what Gilman is very aware of and commenting on. So she's trying to show us just how destructive it can be to take somebody who has certain issues going on and to remove them, to isolate them, where all they can do is feed on their own uh, issues in private. And so one of the things we get in the story, I would say, is a representation of somebody completely coming apart at the seams because of the way they're being treated. The fact that it's a husband locking up the wife is also incredibly significant to what Perkins uh, Gilman is trying to get across. Um, so there's that whole set of stuff going on in this story uh, that makes it so fascinating and so interesting. And I certainly hope that you, um, this is a story where, you know, one of the things we haven't talked too much about is when we read a story, we should expect to be uh, stretched a little bit. We should expect to be challenged. We should expect to be uncertain um, about what's going on. It should take us a while to adapt to the author's style. And we should expect that and recognize that as a good thing because that demonstrates our growth as a reader, our ability to apply some critical thought to what we're reading, and then to come up with 
a conclusion based upon what's been set in front of us. All of that's really positive. So when you're reading yellow wallpaper, it can take you a while to try to figure out, you know, just, just what's going on here. But once you get used to the rhythm of the story and you get a sense of, okay, I'm dealing with a unreliable narrator, to use a phrase that I've used before, um, and the nature of her unreliability, if that's even a word, why it is she's unreliable will become evident to me if I pay careful attention to what she says. Now, I don't want to um, contradict myself and suggest, well, there's, there's hidden meaning in the story because I spent a lot of time ranting and raving about not requiring hidden meaning in a story. And I still hold to that. But what I mean here is that this is a fascinating voice and it would benefit us to pay attention to what it says because it doesn't speak in ways that we would expect. Just for example, just to go back, I mean that, you know, to the conclusion where, wh why is she telling us that she's whispering this phrase, the key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf? Like, why is she doing that? Um, why does she speak in that way? What does that indicate about her? You know, and this is a voice I want to pay attention to because it's not communicating in a way I would expect. And what's interesting about the voice is that it communicates in ways they don't expect. So there's that. And then there's all kinds of questions. You know, who is the woman that she's seeing? Is she merely projecting out? Is there indeed a ghost? Uh, is this a great haunted, haunted, uh, haunted house story? There's some evidence for that. Let's go back to the quote that I was looking at at the beginning of the story, second paragraph. She's talking about the house she's trapped in, a colonial mansion, a hereditary estate. I would say a haunted house and reach the height of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. So does she want it to be a haunted house? Because it kind of turns into that by the end of the story, or if only because her own mind has led her to make all these observations about what's going on in the home. Um... One of the things we haven't talked a lot about in this course yet, but which we'll talk more about as we go forward, is that all the stories that we're reading are interesting to look at themselves, which is how I've been talking about them with you. But it's also the case that every story we've read in this class is part of what's called a literary tradition. And what that means is that it's, it's, it's writing in reference to stories that came before. One of the things the yellow wallpaper is doing, and this is going to be particularly important for a few other stories we'll read this term, is it's writing in, in response to what's called the Gothic tradition. And the Gothic tradition is a long storytelling tradition, really begins in the mid 19th century, 1760s, 18th century, excuse me, 1760s. That involves ghosts and haunted houses and women locked up in haunted houses and their efforts to be rescued. Um, We'll talk more about that another day, probably, but the yellow wallpaper is very intentionally positioning itself as a document in response to that. So the narrator is fascinating, and this is one of those stories where if you didn't think it was important to have a grasp of, you know, first person, third person, omniscient, limited omniscient, uh, unreliable, if you didn't think those were important terms, I, I hope the yellow wallpaper drives that point home to you. I also hope you enjoyed this story because this is one of my favorite stories. As I said at the beginning of, of the class, and it's my favorite story because it's so creepy, but also because it's uh, such a wonderful reward that you receive if you take the time to think about what's going on here. Um, you know, if you think about the peculiarity and the nature and the specific aspects of her weirdness, she's a fascinating character. Uh, this woman trapped in the, the attic uh, with the wallpaper. Um, so give her the time she deserves because you know, John certainly hasn't. Uh, and um, hope you enjoy it. And I look forward to hearing what it is you have to say about it.